It's clear technology can be a positive force, but it's equally clear that we just can't be wide-eyed about the innovations technology creates. There are very real and important questions being raised about the impact of these advances and the role they'll play in our lives. AI is going to impact many, many fields. And I want to give you a couple of examples today. Healthcare is one of the most important fields AI is going to transform. Last year, we announced our work on diabetic retinopathy, which is a leading cause of blindness, and we used deep learning to help doctors diagnose it earlier. It turned out, using the same retinal scans, there were things which humans quite didn't know to look for, but our AI systems offered more insights. Your same eye scan turns out holds information with which we can predict the five-year risk of you having an adverse cardiovascular event, heart attack or strokes. So to me, the interesting thing is that you know, more than what doctors could find in these eye scans, the machine learning systems offered newer insights. This could be the basis for a new non-invasive way to detect uh, cardiovascular risk. Another area where AI can help is to actually help doctors predict medical events. And so we've put our machine learning systems to work. We've been working with our partners using de-identified medical records. And it turns out if you go and analyze over 100,000 data points per patient, more than any single doctor could analyze, we can actually quantitatively predict the chance of readmission 24 to 48 hours before earlier than traditional methods. It gives doctors more time to act. Another area where AI can help is accessibility. So we have machine learning uh, technology called Looking to Listen. It not only looks for audio cues, but combines it with visual cues to clearly disambiguate the two voices. Let's see how that can work, maybe in YouTube. Not on a Danny Ainge level, but he's above a Colangelo level. In other words, he understands enough to you said, you said it was all right to lose on purpose. You said it's all right to lose on purpose and advertise that to the fence. It's perfectly OK. You said it's OK. We have nothing else to talk about. We have a lot to talk about. <laughs> Another example of uh, one of our core products, which we are redesigning with AI, is Gmail. We just had a new, fresher look for Gmail, a recent redesign. Hope you're all enjoying using it. We are bringing another feature to Gmail. We call it Smart Compose. So as the name suggests, we use machine learning to start suggesting phrases for you as you type. All you need to do is to hit tab and keep auto-completing. <laughs> we are rolling out Smart Compose to all our users this month and hope you enjoy using it as well. Another product which we built from the ground up using AI is Google Photos. So we are bringing a new feature called Suggested Actions, essentially suggesting smart actions right in context for you to act on. Say, for example, if the photo in the same wedding, if the photos are underexposed, our AI systems offer a suggestion to fix the brightness right there, one tap, and we, we can fix the brightness for you. Or if you took a picture of a document which you want to save for later, we can recognize, convert the document to PDF, and make it, make it much easier for you to use later. By the way, AI can also deliver unexpected moments. So for example, if you have this picture, cute picture of your kid, we can make it better. We can drop the background color, pop the color, and make the kid even cuter. Or if you happen to have a very special memory, something in black and white, maybe of your mother and grandmother, we can recreate that moment in color and, and make that moment even more real and special. Our vision for the perfect assistant is that it's naturally conversational. It's there when you need it so that you can get things done in the real world. But 18 months ago, we announced a breakthrough from our DeepMind team called WaveNet. Unlike the current systems, WaveNet actually models the underlying raw audio to create a more natural voice. It's closer to how humans speak. 
the pitch, the pace, even all the pauses that convey meaning. We want to get all of that right. So we've worked hard with WaveNet, and we are adding, as of today, six new voices to the Google Assistant. Let's have them say hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm your Google Assistant. Welcome to Shoreline Amphitheater. We hope you'll enjoy Google I.O. Back to you, Sundar. With this technology, we started wondering who we could get into the studio with an amazing voice. Take a look. Couscous, a type of North African semolina and granules made from crushed durum wheat. Can you tell me where you live? You can find me on all kinds of devices, phones, Google Homes, and if I'm lucky, in your heart. That's right, John Legend's voice is coming to the assistant. His voice will be coming later this year in certain contexts so that you can get responses like this. Today, we're going to share with you some important ways that the assistant is becoming more naturally conversational and visually assistive in order to help you do more and get time back. But to be a great conversation partner, the assistant needs to deeply understand the social dynamics of conversation. Now you won't have to say, hey, Google, every time. Check this out. Hey, Google, did the Warriors win? Yes, the Warriors won 118 to 92 last Sunday against the Pelicans. Nice. When's their next game? The Warriors' next game is today at 7.30 PM, where they will be playing the Pelicans. Great. It's going to be fun to watch tonight. Hey, remind me to find my Kevin Durant jersey when I get home. Sure, I'll remind you when you get home. Now notice that I was able to have a natural back and forth conversation with my assistant without having to repeat, hey, Google, for every follow-up request. Even more helpful, my assistant could understand when I was talking to it versus when I was talking to all of you. We call this continued conversation, and it's been a top feature request. You'll be able to turn it on in the coming weeks. So let's say it's almost game time. Hey, Google, turn on the Warriors game and start the popcorn maker. Sure, here's the Golden State Warriors game on YouTube TV and turning the popcorn maker on. Oh, and can you dim the lights in the family room and in the kitchen? Sure, dimming the lights in the family room and in the kitchen. Now, you'll notice that in both of these examples, I asked for multiple things at once, something that feels really natural for us, but it's very difficult for computers to understand. It's something we call multiple actions, and we're rolling out this capability in the Assistant now. We've also been working on improving the conversation with the Google Assistant for families. Today, we're going to unveil a new visual canvas for the Google Assistant across screens. We're working with some of the best consumer electronic brands. And today, I'm excited to announce that the first smart displays will go on sale in July. 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Good happening out here. Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. With Android P, we partnered with DeepMind to work on a new feature we call Adaptive Battery. It's designed to give you a more consistent battery experience. Adaptive Battery uses on-device machine learning to figure out which apps you'll use in the next few hours and which you won't use until later, if at all, today. 
With Android P, we've, we're introducing a new on-device machine learning feature we call Adaptive Brightness. Adaptive Brightness learns how you like to set the brightness slider, given the ambient lighting, and then does it for you in a power-efficient way. So you'll literally see the brightness slider move as the phone adapts to your preferences. Last year, we introduced the concept of predicted apps, a feature that places the next apps the OS anticipates you need on the path you'd normally follow to launch that app. And it's very effective, with an almost 60% prediction rate. With Android P, we're going beyond simply predicting the next app to launch to predicting the next action you want to take. We call this feature App Actions. The phone is adapting to me and trying to help me get to my next task more quickly. As another example, if I connect my headphones, Android will surface an action to resume the album I was listening to. Slices are a new API for developers to define interactive snippets of their app UI that can be surfaced in different places in the OS. Let's say I'm out and about, and I need to get a ride to work. If I type Lyft into the Google Search app, I now see a Slice from the Lyft app installed on my phone. Lyft is using the Slice API's rich array of UI templates to render a slice of their app in the context of search. And then Lyft is able to give me the price for my trip to work, and the Slice is interactive, so I can order the ride directly from it. Pretty nice. With Android P, we put a special uh, emphasis on simplicity by addressing many pain points where we thought, and you told us, the experience was more complicated than it ought to be. And you'll find these improvements on any device that adopts Google's version of the Android UI, such as Google Pixel and Android One devices. And the first striking thing you'll notice is the single clean home button. And the design recognizes a trend towards smaller screen bezels and places an emphasis on gestures over multiple buttons at the edge of the screen. So when I swipe up, I'm immediately brought to the overview where I can resume apps I've recently used. I also get five predicted apps at the bottom of the screen to save me time. Now, if I continue to swipe up or I swipe up a second time, I get to all apps. So architecturally, what we've done is combine the all apps and overview spaces into one. And the swipe up gesture works from anywhere, no matter what app I'm in, so that I can quickly get back to all apps and overview without losing the context I'm in. And if you prefer, you can also use the quick scrub gesture by sliding the home button sideways to scroll through your recent set of apps like so. We're adding a new tab to Maps called For You. It's designed to tell you what you need to know about the neighborhoods you care about, new places that are opening, what's trending now, and personal recommendations. This is super useful because with zero work, Maps is giving me ideas to kick me out of my rut and inspire me to try something new. We've created a score called Your Match to help you find more places that you'll love. Your Match uses machine learning to combine what Google knows about hundreds of millions of places with the information that I've added, restaurants I've rated, cuisines I've liked, and places that I've been to. If you cook into the match number, you'll see reasons explaining why it's recommended just for you. It's your personal score for places. Now, another pain point we often hear from our users is that planning with others can be a real challenge. So we wanted to make it easier to pick a place together. Here's how. Long press on any place to add it to a short list. Now, I'm always up for ramen, but I know my friends have lots of opinions of their own, so I can add some more options to give them some choices. When you've collected enough places, that you like, share the list with your friends to get their input too. You can easily share with just a couple of taps on any platform that you prefer. Then my friends can add more places if they want to, or just vote with one simple click so we can quickly choose a group favorite. This is just a glimpse of some of what's coming to Maps on both Android and iOS later this summer. Our teams have been working really hard to combine the power of the camera, the computer vision, with Street View and Maps to reimagine walking navigation. So here's how it could look like in Google Maps. Let's take a look. You open the camera. You... you instantly, you instantly know where you are. No futzing with the phone. You, you, all the information on the map, the street names, the directions, right there in front of you. Notice that you also see the map, so that way you stay oriented. 
Uh, you can start to see nearby places, so you see what's around you. But we think the camera can also help you do more with what you see. That's why we started working on Google Lens. Now, people are already using it for all sorts of answers, and especially when the questions are difficult to describe in words. Answers like, oh, that cute dog in the park, that's a labradoodle. Or this building in Chicago is the Wrigley Building, and it's 425 feet tall. Now, today, Lens is a capability in Google products, like Photos and the Assistant. But we're very excited that starting next week, Lens will be integrated right inside the camera app on the Pixel, the new LG G7, and a lot more devices. This way, it makes it super easy for you to use Lens on things right in front of you already in the camera. Lens can now recognize and understand words. But now, with smart text selection, you can now connect the words you see with the answers and actions you need. So you can do things like copy and paste from the real world directly into your phone. The next feature I want to talk about is called Style Match. You're at your friend's place, you check out this trendy looking lamp, and you want to know things that match that style. Or if you see an outfit that catches your eye, you can simply open the camera, tap on any item, and find out, of course, specific information like reviews, et cetera, of any specific item. But you can also see all the things and browse around that match that style. So the last thing I want to tell you about today is how we are making lens work in real time. You open the camera, and you start to see lens surface proactively all the information instantly. And it even anchors that information to the things that you see. And in, over time, what we want to do is actually overlay the live results directly on top of things like storefronts, street signs, or a concert poster. So you can simply point your phone at a concert poster of uh, Charlie Puth, and the music video just starts to play, just like that. Today, Waymo is the only company in the world with a fleet of fully self-driving cars with no one in the driver's seat on public roads. So Phoenix will be the first stop for Waymo's driverless transportation service, which is launching later this year. Soon, everyone will be able to call Waymo using our app, and a fully self-driving car will pull up with no one in the driver's seat to whisk them away to their destination. Google was already deploying a new technique called deep learning, a type of machine learning that allows you to create neural networks with multiple layers to solve more complex problems. So our self-driving engineers teamed up with researchers from the Google Brain team. And within a matter of months, we reduced the error rate for detecting pedestrians by 100x. That's right, not 100%, but 100 times. Now at Waymo, AI touches every part of our system, from perception to prediction to decision making to mapping and so much more. So first, perception. Detecting and classifying objects is a key part of driving. And pedestrians in particular pose a unique challenge because they come in all kinds of shapes, postures, and sizes. Here's a pedestrian crossing the street concealed by a plank of wood. And here, we have pedestrians who are dressed in inflatable dinosaur costumes. Now, traditionally, in computer vision, Neural networks are used just on camera images and video. But our cars have a lot more than just cameras. We also have lasers to measure distance and shapes of objects, and radars to measure their speed. And by applying machine learning to this combination of sensor data, we can accurately detect pedestrians in all forms in real time. A second area where machine learning has been incredibly powerful for Waymo is predicting how people will behave on the road. Now, sometimes, People do exactly what you expect them to, and sometimes they don't. Take this example of a car running a red light. Our car is about to proceed straight through an intersection. We have a clear green light, and cross traffic is stopped with a red light. But just as we enter the intersection, all the way in the right corner, we see a vehicle coming fast. Our models understand that this is unusual behavior for a vehicle that should be decelerating. We predict the car will run the red light. So we preemptively slow down, which you can see here with this red fence. And this gives the red light runner room to pass in front of us while it barely avoids hitting another vehicle. And with this kind of scale, both in training and validation of our models, we can quickly and efficiently 
teach our cars new skills. 